so this is just an interview for the newspaper. I just have a couple of questions. Mr. Gray will see you now. What was he like? He was polite, intense, smart, really intimidating. Do you have any interests outside of work? What about you? I'd like to know more about you. There's really not much to know about me. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I am. To what do you owe your success? I exercise control in all things, Miss Steele. It must be really boring. Start in life. You should steer clear of me. Got me hoping you save me right now. You kiss. Got I don't me do romance. Right now. Looking so crazy. My tastes are very singular. You wouldn't understand. What's up? <laughs> I hope all you notice that in honor of the film, we are both coordinated in gray. Except in the many socks. shades of gray. Except the socks. Oh, yeah, well. So, Victor, I need to ask you a very serious, very pointed question first. Whoa, already? I mean, right? This guy here, damn. How did you wind up the only person in 50 shades of gray to keep their clothes on? Oh, I don't know. You know, when I first got the part, I, um, I called my aunt and I made sure that I was like, Auntie, am I getting naked in this movie? <laughs> because if I am, that means you and Abuela are not going to come see it. Um, so it was cool, though. Um, when I found out that I got the part, everybody was obviously very excited for me. But, um, you know, it was just one of those things. It's like I'm not naked in the movie or in any of the three books, whoever read the books. Um, I'm not naked in any of them. Any, but trust any me, plans? Trust me, when you guys watch the movie, there will be plenty of nakedness in it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Were you aware of, I guess, the... I, I feel like any, way, any word you use to describe the book or the movie has such a double entendre, so I'm trying to find like a G-rated way of saying it, but of the humongous following that it had? I mean, what was your question? I'm sorry. Were you aware of the humongous oh, fan oh, following? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I hadn't read the book. When I got the part, I hadn't read the book, mm -hmm. but obviously I knew the phenomenon um, that Fifty Shades is, and... The, the first time when, uh, when I found out about it, um, I knew everyone had read it, but I didn't read it at the time. And I could see, when I finally got the part and I read it, I could see, obviously, the, the, the attraction to it. But for me, when you sort of follow all the work that I've done, I've always been one to um, do work that has some sort of coming-of-age element to it. And with this film, you know, people are always caught up with the sex element or the, mm -hmm. the scene, you know, the sexual scenes or the eroticism, rather, of the film. But... You know, there's a real coming-of-age story of a young woman and her first love, and I really love what our director did, Sam Taylor Johnson, because she she focused on the characters and and like it, it, the whole from the beginning to the end when Anna meets Christian, there's like a real nice sort of development and like, you know, when it all comes to you know all the erotic scenes, you also you you kind of like root for them in a way. You saw the film too. Yeah, yeah I saw yeah. the film on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I really love that it wasn't just about what everybody's talking about. It's like, oh, the sex scenes and, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is just about the sex when it's, just, when it's not, when there's like a human element to it. And it's also about what you're willing to put up with in a relationship and at what point do you say, this isn't working for me anymore or this is never going to work for me. 100%. 100%. And what's great too is that obviously for those who read the book, um, you know, it's consensual with, with Anna, you know, like 
what's really cute about the movie is that um, there's a scene where you remember this part in the movie when they uh, when they when he wrote up the contract and they kind of went they were going back and forth you know that was actually a really funny part of the movie when they were going back and forth and she was like I'm not gonna do this and then you could kind of see his, that. well and then yeah. he could kind of see in his face he's like mm hmm okay that's cool um, I will be willing to do this she said and then he's like okay and then and the part that I started laughing is she goes what are plugs <laughs> she, he, <laughs> I don't want to give it away what he says, but it was really funny. I asked her about that Saturday, and she said, now I know what they are. Yeah, 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 yeah. you'll know after, yeah. What was, what was the production like on this? Was it tense? Was it, did everyone stay in character? Or was it super loose, and you guys went out for drinks after? Uh, yes, to all of the above. Um, we, it was definitely loose, and it was one of those things where, for me, I was really excited to work on it because, you know, I didn't want the film to be sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, cheesy, you know? And when I knew that Sam Taylor Johnson was gonna direct the film, I was such a huge fan of her first movie, which is a movie called Nowhere Boy, mm -hmm. which was the, um, the you know, Lennon. the early life of yeah. John Lennon. Um, and so I knew that they already got a really good filmmaker. And so when I got the part, um, I knew that she was gonna focus on character. Anyway, long story short, in terms of how it was production, um, you know, E.L. James, Erica, she was, she's the author, and she was so adamant about making the, the, the movie just as close to the book as possible. And so was, so was Sam. And usually when you work on films, you don't see that kind of collaboration because there's either ego or there's different opinions, you know? Um, but on this film, like, there was definitely so much collaboration. And they let us be free as actors to, you know, we didn't change the lines around or nothing like that. But if we had ideas, they, they, they weren't, they were open-minded for us to, like, change it or, you know, add a little bit of us. You know, I'm Latin, so I want to throw in a little Latin flavor. She let me do it, you know. <laughs> what made it in the movie is up to you guys to see, but, you know, it was, it was definitely cool to work on the film. Was it daunting for you to take on a project of this scope? Uh, of this size? Yeah. Um, it wasn't daunting because, again, when I saw that Sam Taylor Johnson was attached to it, she, when I saw Nowhere Boy, I was such a huge fan that you couldn't already tell when you watched that film that she was all about character. And, and you know, when you sort of follow my career, I've always been one to, you know, be attracted to working with directors like Sam. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, it wasn't daunting. Maybe the phenomenon of it was like, oh my God, it's a big deal, but it never felt like that on the movie. Except obviously when you saw paparazzi or fans like waiting, you could kind of get a sense of how big the movie is gonna be, but it was never like that on set. Well, I think it's really great that you're like the only one in the film whose family can actually see it without any, yeah. you know, without yeah. any uh, preparation. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And I understand that Kevin Williamson was nice enough to let you fly from L.A. here to promote it. Yes, from yes. From Stalker. Yes, I'm shooting Stalker right now. It's a TV show on CBS. Um, and it's a show about a group of detectives who solely focus on cases of stalking, which is interesting because not all cities have this unit. And the way how it happened with L.A., um, I don't know if you guys remember this actress. She died in 89. She was killed by a stalker. Her name was Rebecca Schaefer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she, she was killed by a fan who was stalking her. And at the time, there were no laws or any sort of, like, you know, uh, law enforcement that focused on stalking cases. And so after that, the LAPD created a, a unit called TMU, which is uh, short for Threat Management Unit. Um, in the show, we say TAU because we can't steal their acronym. It's a uh, it's Threat Assessment Unit on the show. Anyway. Um, so, uh, once that unit was formed, uh, um, uh, you know, obviously now people, when they're stalked or they feel like they're being stalked, at least now you have rights. Before you didn't have any rights in terms of, you know, getting a, 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 a what do you call them? A, restraining a, order. Restraining order, yeah, you gotta get a restraining order. But, um, but also, I know that there's a reputation about the show that the show's too dark and the show, you know, it like glorifies stalking. And, like, we want to put out there that that's not what we're glorifying at all. We want you guys to know or people to know that, like, you can always go to law enforcement because you actually have rights, you know, in terms of what, what the boundary is. If somebody's, like, stalking you, there's actually boundaries now that, that people can get, you know, prosecuted for that. And so we want people to see that you don't have to be a victim when you watch the show. You know that, like, you can go to law enforcement and they're not going to just be like, oh, no, that's not considered stalking when, in fact, it is. And what is it like being on a, I mean, how to make it in America, big bummer that that was canceled, I, I think a lot of people. I know, I get that, that all the time. You know, I'm sure you do. <laughs> what does it feel like being on a network show? I guess, again, to some extent. You know, I think it's almost the same. The only thing is that the hours are crazy on network. Um, it's a lot longer. And, you know, my show, The Stalker now is an hour, and How to Make it in America was a half an mm -hmm. hour. 
Um, so definitely the hours are, are different. But, you know, also what's cool is that on this show is that I get to work with Dylan McDermott and Maggie Q, and, um, and we just cast um, Mira, Sovino, Mira Sovino. And so, you know, I haven't, I haven't gotten to work with, like, actors who've been in the game for so long, you know, especially Dylan. And you start realizing that, like, life ain't really that serious, man. You're, like, you just go to work, you do your <laughs> thing, and you have a good time. And, like, I feel like when I work with Dylan, it's like he's so serious when the camera's on and he's on point and, he, and he's... And, he, and he's got that thing, you know? And I was like, dude, how do you do that? And just every time we do a scene, I, like, I would literally just be watching him like, man, how, you, you good. You, you're good, man. You're good. You have a future. Uh, I, think, I think you might have a career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, what's funny is that he's also really funny. People don't realize how funny he is. And I think that's contrib it contributes to how good of an actor he is, mm -hmm. too, because he doesn't take himself that serious because he's like, you know, we're acting. We're having a good time. We're doing what we love. Like, Bro, it's not that serious, you know? <laughs> I mean, you've had quite a streak the past few years. What's been the number one lesson you've learned? In terms of what, just, just acting yeah, with a business? Yeah, just your career, like just from being, or... You know, it's just, one thing that I learned is that, and a lot of actor friends of mine who are really successful, and I've been really blessed to have these guys in my, in my I guess in my circle, in my life, um, is that you always want to sizzle. You never want to be too hot, or you don't want to be too cold. You just want to be consistent, and if you could be consistent, you're already, you're, 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 you're very successful already mm -hmm. just by being consistent. But I always love that term. Like, he, he said, my friend uh, Sam Rockwell, he was like, you always want to sizzle. You never want to be too hot or too cold. You just want to sizzle. Nice name drop there, Sam Rockwell. Love it. Well We're done. Well Why played. Not? He'll love it. <laughs> and I know you worked with one of my personal favorites, Heath Who? Ledger. Who? Heath. Oh, Heath Ledger, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah what yeah. did you, what's, what's like a really great memory that you have of working with him? Wow. You know, there's a scene in uh, Lords of Dogtown when Heath is a... Uh, I don't, I don't know if you guys saw Lords of Dogtown, but there's a scene at the very end when, uh, you know, he, we all sort of came up and we built this huge skateboard brand. And, like, you follow us through the journey on how we went from nothing and we became such a huge popular, you know, skateboard team or whatever. And we became we, the, 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 the group of act or well, the group of uh, the guys that we played in the movie. They actually um, revolutionized skateboarding. And mm -hmm. that's why we have X Games now and vertical skating is because of the guys that I portrayed in the movie. And so in the end of the movie, we, you know, you see our journey with how we came from nothing and we became so famous in the movie. And he, he had this scene that was so, it was so amazing. Like, I think it's the only gut-wrenching scene in the whole movie is when he came, with, he came up with us in this journey and at the very end, you just kind of just see him just kind of like, like letting it all go. He just, he just let the brand go. He let everything he worked for just go. And obviously, you know, when Heath Ledger was shooting, Heath Ledger, the person, when he was shooting the scene, he was obviously like on the come up, you know what I mean? Yeah. He had Brokeback Mountain. And so to actually let that all go, like what was going on in your, rea in your real life, and sort of play this character where it's like, it's almost like as if he let his, himself go. Like all the success that mm -hmm. Heath Ledger, the actor, was kind of like letting it all go. And I just, I just thought that to be able to connect to that in front of a whole bunch of strangers, just like this, a crew of like, you know, 70 to 100 people, I thought it was amazing to watch. Now, the personal advice he gave me was, you know, I was really young when I first started that movie. It was like my first real legit Hollywood movie. And um, I remember I was like, really just like, you know, it was one of those scenes when I had to sort of, I enter the scene and I'm like, man, I want to be famous. I want, you know, I, I, want to, I want to have girls. I want to make money. I want to do it all right now. You know, that was one of my lines in it. I still remember the line. Um, and then, and then uh, so in between takes, I'm like revving myself up. And I'm like, man, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go in just like this because that's the energy that, you know, the director wants. And then he, I, I, could, I could see that he was like watching me. I could, I could feel it, you know. And he comes up to me and he just literally takes his hands. He was a big guy, by the way. He was like 6'3". Um, and he came up to me and he just put his hands right on my shoulders. And I remember feeling just like his energy and like his hands when they hit my shoulder and just... It was like, you, never, you ever heard a gunshot, how it just like vibrates in your whole body? It's just like, boom. And he landed, and he said, mate, relax. <laughs> relax. And I know it's just one word, but the, it said so much because I feel like we put so much energy, especially as young, you know, as young entrepreneurs or whatever everyone wants to do in, you know, in this room. And like sometimes if you just relax and you just know what the goal is, like you'll accomplish it. And I feel like he really set the, set, you know, set the trend for me in my career and in my own personal life was from that one word. It was like, mate. Relax. Relax. And that was it. You're like, and no, I mean, he looked, did me, you? he looked at me dead in my eyes and he said that. And we had shot for like months, you know, two months or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he never looked at me like that. And I, and I knew exactly what he meant. 
And ever since then, every time I do a scene where I'm like, especially how to make it in America, like I had so much energy yeah. and I was like, yo, yeah. yo, yo, let's get these jeans, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, <laughs> that, all comes, that all comes from a place though of relaxation. Like I just don't come up there and, like, and I can rev myself up no more. I just kind of know what my goal is and what mm -hmm. I want in the scene. And it all happened from that one word that Heath gave me that one time in 2006, you know? That's amazing. Yeah, it was cool, it was cool. And I, I think I told you back there that Heath was one of the only three people I've ever interviewed in my entire career who insisted on paying for dinner because celebrities never pay. Um, yeah. They don't even carry money with them for the yeah. most part. Um, and could, because he said he was raised by a single mom and he was taught that a lady never pays. Yeah, and I this was like, surprised me, yeah. I mean, I, I was yeah. like, wow, that's just, it was like so human and polite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he was also, too, I mean, there would always be, like, little advice he would give us because, mm -hmm. you know, it was uh, me, Emil Hirsch, and John Robinson. And this was, like, our first big movie, and he would always just sort of kind of school us on the business and know, like, oh, this is what you're going to look, this, these are the things that you should look out for now that you're about to mm -hmm. enter this, this crazy business, Hollywood, showbiz. You're a New York guy. How do you yeah. keep your head on straight in Hollywood? Um, I think you just said it right there. It's because I'm from New York. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in the Lower East Side. For those who are not from New York, Lower East Side. It's a very fancy area. Now, now. <laughs> when I grew up, it wasn't that fancy. <laughs> I think so. There were, like, there were like squatters, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and like there was riots between the police and the squatters. <laughs> there were actually, there was actually vacant buildings in Lower East Side. That's not even, that doesn't even exist I no mean, more. Like Whole Foods would take them over if there was a vacant if building. If they could, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, what was cool about Lower East Side when I grew up was always the little gardens that were in between buildings. There was mm -hmm. always like these little gardens. Um, and that, you can't even find one. Yeah. But um, to keep my head on straight, I think a lot of it comes from my upbringing. You know, I, I grew up in New York in the 80s and 90s, so, like, it was rough. That was, like, when Thompson Square Park was called Tent City because, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of you know, a lot of homeless people and drug addicts would literally mm -hmm. set up shop in Thompson Square Park. And, you, you know, you better come with these or one of these if you're trying to, like, get them out of there, you know? So there was a lot of riots with the police and the homeless and, and the... And the crack addicts. So anyway, I saw, <laughs> I saw a lot of that and I knew sort of what the struggle is because I was sort of, you know, thrown into it when I was really young. Because just going to school, I had to walk by all of that, you know? It was kind of like an episode, it was like a gnarly episode of The Wire growing up in the <laughs> 90s. It really was. It was more intense than The Wire. It was like the corner. It was like the that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think to keep, keep my head on straight is because, like, I know that, like, I know it's BS and I know it's, like, real, you know, because mm -hmm. I lived it. And, you know, there's other things, too, but that's the stuff that's that the stands one. out. Yeah. And before we turn this over to a few audience questions, um, so much is made, Fifty Shades of Grey, obviously the sex scenes. Yeah. And all my friends who don't work in entertainment are like, oh, my God, it must be so hot shooting them. You have to ask. So talk about the reality of shooting a sex scene on, in any film. You know, some, the reality of shooting a sex scene or whatever mm -hmm. um, is that it actually is a lot more work than what people think. And it's a lot more work because of this. It's because you're more worried about the technicalities of it than the actual portraying that I'm enjoying this mm -hmm. or I'm whatever. Um, so it's actually a little bit more um, nerve wracking because you're always worried about, okay, so the camera's there and like, Okay, so I gotta do, you know, let's just say this is the camera. I'm like, okay, well then, you're not gonna really see anything this angle, so I gotta be there. So, like, already I'm thinking more about the camera, and I'm just saying for mo most actors, they think about more of the technicalities of how, you know, uh, and also to make sure that mm -hmm. your co star is also comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, there's a whole lot, of, there's a whole range of things than actually enjoying, you know, what, what, what we're trying to portray in that moment. So, um, it's actually nerve wracking. I, I hope I didn't, like, you know, ruin it for everyone, but I think as actors, it's actually nerve wracking to shoot love scenes or a sex scene. And I'm sure you want to get it right the first time so you don't have to reshoot it 25 different times. 100%. Yeah. 100%. It'll be in everyone's best interest. All right. Questions? So I'm a huge How to Make It in America fan. Just wanted to know if you could share like, one of your favorite like memories from shooting. Woo! How to Make It in America, man. I love that show. Um, my favorite memory of How to Make It in America is, um, do you remember season two when we opened up and we're in Japan? That was the best part because we actually went to Japan and we literally had, it was not a film production. We, we did guerrilla style filmmaking, which is my favorite style of filmmaking. And we took a camera and we were like literally like shooting in front of people's faces. And like the Japanese were like, they would like look at us, but they wouldn't like, you know, like in New York, they'd be like, Psh, yeah, like that, you know? But in, in Japan, people were like kind of cool about it. And so we were literally shooting in the streets of Japan. And also like, there's that scene, I don't know if you remember, it's, it was such a quick, it was a montage, so I don't know if you'll remember it, but within the montage of the Japan stuff, there was a scene when um, we're shooting like with these girls, you know, 
Um, so the producers found these girls, and they didn't speak a lick of English, right? And literally all the stuff that, like, the director was trying to tell them what to do, they didn't do. And so what happened is that then me and Brian, Brian Greenberg was also co-starring with me on the show. Brian Greenberg and I, we couldn't take the director serious because these girls weren't taking them serious. So if, like, these girls weren't taking, like, this, like, well-known director serious, it's like, then that gave us an excuse not to take them serious. So we had the best time. All the Japan stuff was the best stuff. Could it was you, more fun. It was a lot more fun than the New York stuff. Could you ever see yourself making a movie? Has there been any any talk of that? No, but I, I posted a um, I posted a picture on Instagram with me and Louis Guzman, who mm -hmm. played you know played my cousin on the show, and I kind of teased people and I said uh, I said back with Louis. I, I, I forgot exactly what I said, but I said back with Louis. Um, should we do a season three? How to make it in How to make it in America? What does everybody think? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. And dude, the response was insane. So I'm hoping that HBO sees it because maybe you know Entourage got a movie. Why can't How to Make It? Right? The comeback. Get the Kickstarter you know? crack in. You know? I don't know. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hey. There was a lot of talk about the casting of this movie, and I wonder if you could talk about your audition process and kind of how you got connected with the film. The way how I got connected with the film is, you know, I went through the process like everybody else. Every actor in Hollywood came and auditioned for this film off the bat. So I was already like, you know, I was discouraged, let's just say. <laughs> I was like, you know, there's going to be plenty of Jose's out there, I'm sure. But um, the cool thing was is that when, um, when I shot Godzilla, I was in Godzilla as well. I had a, I had a cool little part in Godzilla. And I worked with Aaron Taylor Johnson, who's married mm -hmm. to Sam Taylor Johnson, which is the director of Fifty Shades of Grey. And so Aaron is the lead in um, Godzilla. And I met Sam during the uh, during the film because he, she would come in, you know, support Aaron. Her and, husband. And yeah, yeah and, and she's also a photographer. She's actually a world-renowned mm -hmm. photographer. And she um, took photos of us on set. And she was like, mad cool. And I'm like, yo, your, your wife is mad cool. And so when we wrapped the movie, we actually all became friends. So when Fifty Shades of Grey came around, she, she obviously had me in mind. But I still, by, you know, by no means did that, like, give me a, a leg up in the whole process because I still had to audition for her. And then I came back again. And then I came back again for the studio because, like, you had to get approved by, like, five different levels of, like, execs, which was cool because I was used to it. And that was, by the way, that was the same process on how to make it in America. Um, but in this case, I think the stakes were a lot higher because of the film. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of that was kind of my only leg in is that I knew Aaron Taylor from shooting Godzilla. Yeah. What will you be doing this week when the movie comes out? That's a good question. Um, you're, wait, well, you're going to be you're going to be in your red room, right? What's going to be where? Your red room at home. Oh, the red room of pain, of course. Yeah. Um, I'll be there. Um, no, I'm just like I'll uh, I'm going to be I'm going to Miami tomorrow and uh, and Wednesday to do more press. And then when Thursday and Friday come around, I'm doing more press in L.A. And it, I was actually going to go see the movie. I already, I already saw the movie. I was going to see the movie, but it's sold out, literally. And I'm not even is trying to, like, really? sell it even more than what it is. It's, it's sold, sold out. out. I can't see this weekend. The studio can't hook you up? No, they're like, they're like, they're like the movie's sold out. Why are they going to hook me up? They're like, the job is done. <laughs> because you're one of the leads of the film. No, but I'm actually happy. I'll just wait, you know, the weekend after. So I'm just going gonna to chill. And, like, you can't get a reservation anywhere because it's, like, Valentine's Day weekend, so it's like I'm gonna be at the crib chilling, <laughs> and then when I get when I when I get you know after next week and the next the weekend after, then I'll see the film. But it's sold out. Whack. All right, last question, folks. They need to have a private screening for you. What is that? Well, I already saw it in a private screening, so, so Let's have another private. But I want I want to support it too. I want to oh, buy. You know, I want to okay. buy a ticket. Yeah. Yo, hey. Uh, hi. Hey. So in the book and in the movie, you kind of play a character who has feelings for someone who only sees him as a good friend. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been in that situation in real life? Have you? <laughs> <laughs> no, we all, we all have, right? We all have in one way or another, right? So when I got the part, again, going back to your question originally, like how, what the process was, how I got the part, that was one thing that I did in the audition is that obviously I could relate to that aspect of Jose. So when I came in, my sides were... Again, if you read the book, there's, a, there's that part when, like, he expresses his love to her, mm -hmm. you know, outside the bar, they're drunk, or whatever. Yeah, so I, they did that. They had me do that in the audition. And so what I did is that, obviously, I tapped in into that, you know, that memory when I got my heart broken, you know, that time way so long ago, right? So I, like, um, damn, I miss her already. No, I'm just fine. Um, 
I was just joking. Um, so I tapped into that, and, you know, the, the, only, the really hard thing was not tapping into that. The, the hard part about, like, getting your heart broken is sort of your reaction after. And that's what actually I loved about Jose is that Jose, it actually plays against, he plays against the stereotype. And when I say the stereotype, what I found cool was that he played against, you know, when you break a, women in here, when you guys break a guy's heart because, you know, he's not the guy that you guys want, right? You let him know nicely, but then sometimes you don't hear from homeboy anymore because it's an ego bruise, right? But when you read the book, you see that Jose kind of like, you know, he licks his wounds and he's like, okay, I got my heart broken, but my relationship with you means more to me than just romantic, so I'm going to stay friends with you. And that's what I actually loved about Jose is that he played against that stereotype, you know, not the machismo, like, well, if you don't like me, well, I'm not going to talk to you, whatever. Like, you know, he's not like that. So um, the, the one thing that was really difficult for me was sort of not that part, what I just said, but was to, sh to show that vulner vulnerability. And you see it in the movie. Like, when I get my heart broken, I'm like, whoa, what? But then, obviously, Christian comes and just gives me the, Ugh, get up off her. The lady said no. <laughs> And I'm like, all right, my bad. <laughs> I'm out. So he kind of cuts me off before I could, like, get hurt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Victor. <laughs> yeah. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you for having you. me. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you.